Good evening, everybody. Glad that you can join us. I'm really excited to be a part of this and uh, appreciate so much the invitation to be here. And I appreciate that you guys are tuning in online and uh, able to be with us uh, as we look at some things from God's Word that I think will be really helpful and uh, some interesting things, I think, that, that really speak to us where we live. And uh, so if you would, like Josh said, uh, get a Bible or pull up Bible app on your phone, uh, however you want to do that. And uh, let's look at and think through some of the things that Jesus says that will be relevant to our lives. I want to start in John chapter 8. So in John 8, Jesus says something. And remember, our focus for this weekend is how we can fix our eyes on Jesus. Things Jesus says, things Jesus teaches us, and the way Jesus can change our lives. And in John 8 and verse 31, Jesus says something that you've probably heard before, but I want you to think with me anew about what this might mean for your life. John chapter 8 and verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that abolished slavery in the United States. And he said in that proclamation that on the first day of January, 1863, all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a slave and to hear those words? To be then and thenceforth and forever free. It's said that when freed slaves saw President Lincoln, they had a hushed reverential awe. Because this man was not just the president. He was their liberator. He was the man who had declared when everyone else said no, that these people are free. And that he would use the military and the navy to back up those claims. It's hard to imagine when you think about the people who were in concentration camps in, in Nazi Germany during World War II, to hear what the sound of the liberating forces would be like, to be one of the people to say, I have been enslaved and now I'm free. And that's what Jesus says. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But a lot of people would argue with Jesus. They would say, wait a minute. Being a Christian, following Jesus, doesn't make you free. Instead, it makes you a slave. You've got all these rules that you have to follow. You kind of have to be brainwashed, they would say. You have to stop being, having fun all the time and start following all these rules. And you have to go to church all the time. You can't do anything you want to do. And so they say, if that's freedom, no thanks. I'm not interested in that. So who's right? Is Jesus right that he'll set us free? Or are those people right that... Following Jesus isn't freedom, it's another form of slavery. I want us to think for a few minutes about freedom and slavery and rules. And I want to encourage us to be free. And I want to talk about how Jesus sets us free. First, Jesus sets us free from sin and guilt and shame. So when you look at this story, uh, the Jews are just as confused as you and I would be. I think sometimes when we talk about freedom and slavery, it's easy to talk about physical slavery and physical freedom. But what Jesus is getting at is kind of a mystery to us. So in John 8 and verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want you to notice how they respond to that. They answered him, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So they push back. Hey, we're not slaves. Now they're kind of fudging the truth a little bit because they had been slaves at different times. And even now the Romans were occupying their land. But you get the points, just like we would say, we live in the land of the free. How could we need to be set free? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus says the key point I want you to see is that if you practice sin, you become sin's slaves. And he is saying, I'll set you free from the slavery of sin. So the Bible doesn't picture sin the way we sometimes think about it. You know, that sin is something you sometimes do and sometimes don't. The Bible pictures sin as something that once you do it, the chains come out. You become enslaved to sin so that in the future, you are more likely to continue to do what sin tells you to do. You become a slave and things get ugly because it gets worse from there. I've said that Jesus sets us free from sin and from guilt and from shame. Because we all know what it is, not just to sin, but then what sin feels like after you've done it. Sin is different from other things we do, where when we look back on it, there is an emotion that's produced in us that is wholly negative. We look back and we don't 
think with pride about what we've done. We don't want to tell other people what we've done. Instead, we want to hide it. We're embarrassed. We're ashamed. And that is the natural consequence of sin. So when Jesus says, I'll set you free, he is speaking to where we live. We live in a position where sometimes we do things that we are no longer proud of, that we want to hide, that we're embarrassed by. I want you to go with me to Romans 6. Paul talks about in Romans 6 how sin makes us slaves. And it connects very well to what Jesus says about being set free from sin. In Romans 6, this is verse 20. And I want you to think about this in terms of how after you've done something wrong, you felt about it. Romans 6 and verse 20, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So what he is saying when he says, what fruit did you get? Is what benefit did sin bring to your life? How did you feel better about yourself, who you were, what you had done? What could you do that you could say, I'm proud of this. I want to tell other people of this. Instead, what we feel is the feeling that innocence is lost. That we're embarrassed by who we've become. That there are things about us that we would redo if we could, but we can't. And there are debts that we owe that we would repay if we could, but we can't. In fact, there are some things we've done, even when you apologize, it just doesn't take it away. You could say, I'm sorry. You can try to make up for it, but you can't. That's not the way life works. And so instead, all we have is over time, this increasing burden of more and more sin. Because as we keep living, we keep racking up sin and we keep making mistakes and we feel worse and worse about ourselves and our past. So Jesus is saying what that looks like is slavery. So that more and more you're tied to who you were and it continues to predict in the future who you're going to be. And so in Romans 7, I want you to hear how he talks about this in Romans 7 in verse 15. And I want you to see if you can ever relate to this and think about your own heart and how you've tried to live. Romans 7 and verse 15, he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not... I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I know a lot of that can be confusing about the specifics of, uh, I want to do this, but I don't. I do what I don't want. I want what I do want and all that. Paul's point is he is describing the heart of a man addicted to sin. I want to do right. And there's a part of me that says, I, I prefer to do right. This is what my heart really wants. But then something else happens where I don't end up doing right. Instead, I end up doing wrong. And he says specifically, this is verse 18, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. So I, I no longer have free will. I've given that up. As I began to sin, sin has now taken me captive. And now I no longer have the ability to do those good things. I have to be set free. And so what Paul says is, we, we continue to rack up these debts of sin, and then that kind of becomes predictive of what we do in the future. We continue to do, and then it gets worse and worse, and we go further and further down the rabbit hole. I suspect, I suspect that you guys know what I'm talking about when I say that. I suspect that each one of us has had our own little experience where we started to do things that were wrong, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And it didn't get better, even though we wanted it to get better. It just didn't. I, I suspect maybe that you've dabbled in pornography, and you found that pornography, it doesn't just let go. And it keeps pulling you in further and further down the rabbit hole. Or maybe you've done things, you've gone out with your friends, and you've done things that, that when you got back and the next morning you wake up, you say, I wish I hadn't done that. I regret that so deeply. And yet, the next time they call, there's an appeal there and a draw there, and maybe you go out and you do it again. I suspect we all know what it feels like to want to do right on the one hand, but also feel that strong pull to do what's wrong. And so what Paul is saying is, these are the words of someone who no longer has freedom. Instead, we're bound up in what we've done, which in the past now begins to predict our future. 
Something has to stop this. And so he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he comes to the cross and he says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus says, I'll set you free. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. This is what he means to be set free from sin and from guilt and from shame. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Because the other part of that is that we also have this suspicion and scripture confirms it, that things aren't getting better in our lives. That as we continue to try to fight against sin, we're not winning. And that if we are just willing to stop and look at the situation objectively, we would say, I'm headed down the wrong road. And so death is a part of it. So Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What sin gets us is death. And then a little later, James chapter 1, verse 14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So not only do we have the guilt of how we live now, but in the future, we have the expectation that things won't get any better. So here is what I'm saying. Here is what the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus is. is you don't have to live that way. You can be free from that. But we need to start with the admission that this is where we all go. That we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that because of that, sin makes us slaves. So we have to be set free. So we have to begin here when we talk about freedom in Christ. That freedom means we no longer have to live that life. Instead, we could be set free to do other things. But I want to point out another part of this. Jesus also sets us free from people's expectations. From people's expectations. See, we naturally tend to care a lot about what other people think. And maybe that's our friends. And we have certain friends that for some reason we, we like something about them. We, something about they, we want to be like them. Whatever it may be, there are people who, whose respect we want. And so because they expect certain things from us, we naturally fall in line with them. And I want you to see how sometimes that can be destructive to us and how there can be freedom when we choose to follow Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about this. Uh, he talks about how this can sabotage our spiritual lives. Sometimes people's expectations kind of become a prison to us where we no longer have the freedom to do even what we think we should do because we're worried about disappointing people. In Matthew 6, he talks about how this can poison our own motivations for doing right. Matthew 6 and verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So we can become so consumed with people and their approval, Jesus says, that we start doing things to win their applause. We want them to say how great we are. So if we're doing a good work, if we're praying, if we're giving, if we're fasting, we want other people to notice. We wouldn't do it if nobody else is around because we want to be sure they see how great we are and give us the praise we know we're due. So you can see how what begins as, well, Sometimes it's nice for people to, to notice us and to, to say something kind about us. Then it becomes, it becomes something bigger, something worse, where we begin to be motivated by them. Uh, in John 5 and verse 44, Jesus says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? I want you to notice in that passage how he talks about belief as opposed to seeking glory from each other. We can either seek God's glory and God's approval... Or we can start thinking about what do men want? One way or the other, we're, we're going to have to make a choice. And sometimes those expectations of people become a replacement for what God wants. And we think if we please people, we pleased God. And Jesus says, no, you can't really believe if all you're focused on is what other people think of you. He also says, this is John 12 and verse 42. Uh, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So sometimes the social consequences of our decisions keep us from doing what we know is right. Have you ever been there? I know I shouldn't do this, but what are they going to say? I don't want to have an argument with this person. I don't want it to become a thing. And so we go along. Or 
you know, we're worried, well, if so-and-so sees me here or wants, doesn't want me to do this, then I don't know, what will they think? What will they say? And we become enslaved to what other people think, even when we know what's right. I want you to see a different picture with me in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. So acknowledging the fact that sometimes we, we get so concerned about what other people think about us that we affect our behavior negatively. I want you to see how Paul is different. And I know that some of this may sound like Bible talk as we read through this, but I want you to think about the man behind what's being written here. Think about a man who grows up passionate for serving God. And he learns about God. He wants to be a teacher of God's people. And then he sees Jesus on the road to Damascus and everything changes. His whole life changes. And suddenly he's not nearly as concerned about elevating himself among his Jewish peers. Instead, he becomes the perpetual outcast. He becomes the person nobody wants to see. And when they see him, they run him out of town. So Paul had to face down the issue of other people's expectations. I want you to hear how he talks about it. Philippians 3 and verse 4. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has confident, reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Confidence in the flesh here means something he can be proud of about who he is. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. By the way, that reads like a resume, doesn't it? Here are my qualifications. In this area, I was this. In this area, I was this. In every way, I was the maximum of everything I could be to serve God. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of, knowledge, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul used to worry about getting people's approval. He wanted to be the, the star in the Jewish landscape, and he was a rising star. But he says, whatever I used to count as gain, whatever used to be good about me, now it's bad. I count it as loss. I count it as rubbish, garbage. Because I found something greater. And if you can read these words without seeing the intensity in Paul, you're missing it. How he says, I count everything loss because I found something that's worth knowing that's beyond everything else. It, it's beyond what people think of me. All my friends and brothers, they can reject me. They can try to stone me and kill me. They can cause riots when they see me. None of that matters to me anymore. What matters is I want to know Christ. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. And if, if I suffer, I'm just sharing in his sufferings. It's the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul found a way to be set free from men's approval. He says this in Galatians. Oh, I missed that one. I guess I didn't put that up. Galatians 1 and verse 10 says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He says, that's Galatians 1 and verse 10. If I were still trying to please man, that's what I used to do. That's who I used to be. But when I became a servant of Christ, things changed. So here is the question. Jesus sets us free from people's expectations. Who is more free? Who is more free? The person who has to do what his friends expect of him because he's worried he might upset them. Or the person who does what he believes is right, even if everybody gets mad. Who's more free? Are you more free when you have to do what other people tell you to do? Or when you just follow Christ? Jesus sets you free from that. That's what he did for Paul. Have you ever known someone who made you feel so happy, so good, so accepted... That you didn't really care what everybody else thought. As long as you were okay with that person, you were okay. That's Jesus. Jesus sets you free from other people's expectations. I, I need to say this. We are struggling with this as a culture. Because we are always worried, especially social media has done this to us. We're always worried, what does everybody think of me? Do people like me? Do they like my posts? Is everybody accepting of the statements I make and the decisions that I make. 
for our young women. It has to be, I need other people's approval. I need other people to tell me I'm beautiful before I matter. For our young men, we need a group we feel like accepts us and knows us. And so we we struggle with that. We don't know how to handle it. What we need is freedom. To be able to say, I know that no matter what other people say about me, Jesus loves me and accepts me exactly as I am. And so I'm free. Now, if other people like me, that's great. If they don't, I'm okay. Because I'm free from their expectations. But Jesus doesn't just set us free from certain things. I want to take a turn here. And talk about how he sets us free to do certain things. Freedom is not just the absence of bad things. But sometimes we need to talk about what that means for us going forward. So I want to talk about how Jesus sets us free to become what we were made to be. I want to go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. When when scripture describes the change that happens in a Christian. When we go from darkness to light. There is of course the expectation that our lives are different. We become new people. And I want you to see, though, how that creates a different kind of slavery along with a different kind of freedom. In Romans 6 and verse 22, we read earlier about what fruit did we have when we were enslaved to sin. But Romans 6, 22 says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he says, now that you have been set free, you do have fruit. But he also doesn't mince words here in verse 22. He says, you have become slaves of God. You are still slaves, but slaves in a different way, a new way. Slaves that get the fruit of their labor. This is, well, that's the wrong passage. Okay, well, that one didn't make it either. Sorry about that. Uh, So this is the point of being a Christian, that we now have works that we do. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a plan for how you should live your life. And it is the plan that will make you into exactly who you were made to be. It will make you the best person you could possibly be. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that God has a plan for how he wants us to live. Obviously, God created us He knows why he made us. He knows how we work. He knows what's best for us. So God made you to be a certain kind of person. The problem is that before Jesus, no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't be that person. Because you still had all that baggage of sin and you were still enslaved to sin. So when I was a sinner, I stayed in my sin. I did some right things, but the sin sucked me back in. I needed to be set free, but now, now I am free and I can make those choices because of the power of the spirit who lives in me. But somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about slavery again. I thought we were saying that Jesus sets us free to become who we were made to be. Someone's talking about rules again. We're slaves. How is that freedom? So let's talk about that. I just want to spend a couple of minutes here addressing this idea about freedom and rules and becoming the person God made us to be. I think we all love the idea of freedom, but I think we all have to acknowledge that absolute freedom goes too far. So I should be free to do whatever I want, but if I am free to punch you in the nose, that's freedom that goes too far. Okay, I shouldn't be that free because soon my freedoms begin to impinge on your freedoms. We need to acknowledge that freedom is best enjoyed within certain parameters. If you ever tried to plant anything, you try to plant a garden. Gardens grow best when things are organized and fenced in and weeded and seeded and watered. And you can look at that garden and you can say, wow, that's a great garden. But what you can't say is that just grew free. It took some work and it took some boundaries. We might think that that's not freedom. But what we need to see here is that sometimes we sacrifice freedom to pursue worthwhile things. So I'm a marathoner. And in marathoning, sometimes I have to sacrifice certain things to pursue that goal. If I want to do well in a marathon, it's going to require some things of me. It's going to require a lot of time. It's going to require some hard work, some education. It's going to take some money. I spend money on gear. I spend money on races. 
I work hard. When I do well, I try to watch what I eat. I don't always watch what I eat. But am I free? Yes, I'm free. I can be a marathoner or not. But if I want to pursue a goal, I have to limit myself so that I can achieve that goal. And so I'm no longer as free as I would have been. But I also can accomplish something by dedicating myself to a goal and limiting that freedom. Students do this. You go to college and you work hard and you pay money because you believe that the degree will be worth it. So you sacrifice some things. You're not as free as you would be otherwise. But you commit yourself to a goal and you limit yourself in pursuit of that goal because you believe the goal is worthwhile. We do this when we go to work so that we can make money. Are you free when you go to work? No, you're not free. You have to go to work. But you believe that that freedom being sacrificed is worth the life that you can have after you make the money. And so you sacrifice some freedom in pursuit of a goal. And there's something else here. We are free to make choices, but we're not free from the consequences of those choices. So even when we talk about pursuing goals, I can have as a goal, I want to run the Olympic marathon. But if I want to run in the Olympic marathon, I am not free. I cannot laze around and jog every few days and then still run in the Olympics. It won't work. So I can have it as a goal, but if I won't sacrifice the freedom, I can't be free from the consequences of what I have chosen. And sometimes we want to do that. We, we want to not take care of our bodies and then have the body we want. We want to not take care of our relationships and have the relationship we want. But, but we can't do that. If we want something, we have to sacrifice what it takes in order to get it. So let's pull this all back around. If we want to talk about freedom in Christ, then Jesus sets us free to become the person we were made to be. He teaches us how to do that, and he instructs us how to do that, and he leads us in doing that. You know, we admire Jesus so much, and I don't just mean Christians. People in the world admire Jesus. They admire what he taught. They admire how he lived. How did Jesus do all that he did? Well, there were a lot of things he didn't do. There were a lot of pursuits he didn't make because Jesus limited himself toward a goal. And he leads us to limit ourselves toward a goal. Now, is that freedom? In a way, yes. In a way, no. But in the only way I can become the man God calls me to be, the man I want to be, is by following Jesus and restricting some of the things that are not going to help me in that goal. So now, in Christ, I have a meaning and I have an identity and I have a goal. I can be the man I want to be. In other words, I'm free. Jesus sets us free to be who he calls us to be. And the last thing I want to say is that Jesus sets us free to choose to serve. We're in Romans 6. Look in Romans 6 and verse 16. It says, Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. So I've been set free from sin, but now I have the freedom to choose to serve righteousness. He talks about that in verse 17 and that we now present ourselves freely to become slaves again, but slaves to something we want to be slaves to, slaves to righteousness. So I'm no longer a slave against my will. I am a willing slave. And there are a number of passages that talk about this transition. Paul says this. This is 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. I want you to see that. I'm free from all. I don't have an obligation to any person. But I still choose to be a servant to them. And that is true freedom. Where we can say, yes, I don't have to do this. But I will anyway. And in that way, no one forces us. It is instead purely from goodwill. There is a huge difference in someone who is held against their will and someone who voluntarily offers their services. Only when we are free does our service have real meaning. And so now we are free to offer meaningful service. And the scripture warns us that there is a danger that once we are free from sin and we're free in Christ, that we'll start being lazy and selfish. And so I want you to see a number of passages that talk about that. I'm going to put them here on the overhead. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, 
but living as servants of God. Notice the difference. He says, be careful not to use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. It's going back to what you were set free from. Instead, live as servants of God. And then this is Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Don't let your freedom take you back into serving the flesh, what you used to be. Instead, he says, here is what's proactive. Go forward and serve one another. Be a servant. So freedom is not freedom from caring about people. Freedom is instead personal freedom that then becomes the freedom to lay down my life and my money and my time to help others. I'm now free to do that in a way that I never was free before. Before, it was always tainted by the fact that it was coming from a position of slavery to sin. Now, instead, I am free. The answer is service. So when we serve this way, we're not just soothing a guilty conscience like we used to do. You know, if, I, if I'm evil sometimes and good sometimes, maybe they'll balance out. Sometimes that's how we serve when we are slaves to sin. We're not trying to score points with God because we feel bad. We're just trying to help others. And I want to encourage you, there is a joy in doing good for others just because we can. Nobody's forcing you. Nobody's holding you hostage. Nobody is telling you, we just expect this of you. You just do it to bless. We just do it to help. We just do it to spread good. We just do it to glorify God. So Jesus sets us free where our service really means something. Because it really does come from an uncoerced heart. It is just what we choose to do. So Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want to ask just one question before we close. That is, how did Jesus live that freedom? I want to remind you that Jesus never got wrapped up in sin. So it wasn't that Jesus worried about sin and guilt and shame like we talked about earlier. And Jesus also didn't just act to please other people. He didn't flatter anybody, and he didn't accept flattery from anybody else. He was not concerned about what the religious leaders thought of him, which sometimes was good and sometimes was bad. Not concerned about the fact that sometimes there were government officials who were after him. Not even concerned by the fact that sometimes people just turned up their nose at his message. Jesus never compromised and never changed things just to please people. He was free. Instead, what he did was he fulfilled God's will for him. He did exactly what the will of the Father was in each instance, what he came to earth to do. He became the man God wanted him to be because he was free. And instead, what he did is he chose to serve. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, and give my life as a ransom for many. So when Jesus came, it was not because other people needed to do for him. It was not because he felt guilty. It was instead something where he willingly said, I want to do this because I love you, because I care for you, and I want to bless you. So Jesus offers real freedom. Not the easy answers of getting to do whatever you feel like, even though there are terrible consequences for doing whatever we feel like. Jesus gives us a path toward fulfilling our purpose, toward forgiveness and peace and service. And then he says, hope of eternal life. So I urge you, be free. Follow Jesus and let him set you free. Thanks for your time.